first, first I'd like to ask how many were here last time? Hold up your hand. Well, let's put, hold it out. Let's go the other way. How many were not here? Hold up your hand. Fine. We're glad to have you here. And I will try to to get across the points that partially that we got uh, across before or tried to, and then also the points that that we want to, for you to understand and the points that we want you to take home with you and the things that we feel, and not only feel, but we know has to be done if we're going to accomplish the goals that we set out to achieve. Tonight, if we were entitling these meetings, it's all the way. And all the way means doing everything we can to reach the goals that we started out to reach. And all the way means putting 30% of the production together nationwide, then in meetings not larger than 10 county areas, that we, those members are called together with telephonic communication between the meetings in which they'll vote on their prices, announce those prices to the world, and if they do not get their prices and their contracts, then it means an all-out holding action in which they'll be advised to hold until they do get those prices and those contracts. Why are we doing this and why are we making the all-out effort to do it? We believe that now that the organization is in a position to attain the goals that we've all worked hard for, but in order to do that, there are certain things that have to be done. And it requires the work of many, many people. There were 12 of us that made a pledge or a covenant or whatever you want to call it that said that we would go up and down and across this country doing everything we could to lead farmers to the right to price their products and to achieve prices and contracts based on the cost of production plus a reasonable profit. This is going to require taking meetings like this, which undoubtedly is larger this week than it was this tonight than it was before. The meetings were held last night, and I'll read off where the meetings were held. If you'll give me those, Lyle, there. And to give you an idea of the size and the scope of the meetings, last night, the meetings were held in Bloomfield, Iowa, Nebraska, Cherokee, Iowa, Flint, Michigan, Great Falls, Montana, LaSalle, Illinois, Marysville, Kansas, and the South Waterloo, uh, Iowa marketing area and the West Wausau marketing area. Tonight, they're in the Kansas City marketing area, which is mostly in Kansas, Miles City, Montana, Moline, Illinois, the East Omaha meeting, the West Omaha meeting, East St. Louis, Sandusky, Ohio, and East Wausau, uh, Wisconsin. Tomorrow night, they'll be in Bismarck, North Dakota, Evansville, Indiana, Madison, uh, Wisconsin, Ottumwa, Iowa, St. Joseph, Missouri, and South Bend, Indiana. Thursday night, it'll be Columbus, Ohio, and Sioux Falls, South Dakota. On Friday night, will be Bemidji, Minnesota, and Indianapolis, Indiana. On Saturday night, will be Lexington, Kentucky, and then on Monday night will be North Waterloo uh, in Iowa. And then uh, we'll have uh, the meetings there. Going back over where the meetings have been held since the last meetings, there's Boise, Idaho, the Georgia, Florida area, Nashville, Tennessee area, the Rapid City, South Dakota area, the Columbia, Washington area, state of Washington, Dublin, Georgia, Florida area, the Jackson, uh, uh, Kentucky area, Tennessee area, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, Klamath Falls, uh, Oregon, and Mississippi, Alabama area, the Sterling, uh, Colorado, the Trenton, New Jersey, uh, North Carolina, Fresno, California, Jonesboro, Arkansas, Syracuse, New York, Wichita, Kansas, uh, Virginia, uh, Arkansas, Texas, uh, California in the Brawley area, the lower Rochester area in Vermont, and then uh, the, the ones of Pocatello, Idaho, and Augusta, Maine, and Montrose, Colorado, and the Durango area. As you notice, that covers the United States. 
The meetings that were attended last night, with the exception of one, the attendance was up anywhere to 25 to 40 percent over what it was two weeks earlier. That's still not enough. It's not what we feel that we needed, but it is, is a start. The only way that this job is going to be done is that we enlarge and enlarge our core of people. You can start with five people and increase it to 10 and 10 to 20 and 20 to 40. Doesn't make any difference how you start on anything. It's the ability to increase and enlarge the core of people that are determined to do something. And when they do that, they will achieve the results. If it's a rightful uh, goal that they have, by working together, they can achieve the results, whatever they want to do. As far as we're concerned, we think that this is a very critical time for agriculture that never before do I believe that any of us have ever lived in a time in agriculture as we are living in right now. And that is that a good example that a man in Minnesota told me how a neighbor boy and wife inherited a 160-acre dairy farm free of indebtedness. He put up a milk parlor, bought dairy cows, and in one year lost it all. It's a time that with a fixed cost and the expenses as high as they are, first time in the history of agriculture that you could lose one or two or three generations of work and savings in one year's time. Not through faulty management, but just because the fixed costs <clears throat> are so high that it's impossible to be able to determine what those costs are going to do to you unless you have the ability to do something about the prices you receive for your product. And I think that if there be any case or any doubt in our minds, all we have to do is think what happened to the cattle people. Many of those saw one or two generations of work and saving and, and investment go down the drain in a one-year period of time. We are only looking at the problems now that we know that the fixed costs are very high. And I wonder tonight if you should take a dollar and 50 cents for your corn this fall and three dollars for soybeans. I just wonder what effect that would really have on everybody in this room. And right now, there's no assurance that you won't. There's no assurance of anything that you have right now as individual operators and producers of being able to assure in any way what the price is going to be. And this is so much different than what's happening in the rest of our economy and what's happened through our economy since the beginning of the NFO because the companies have gotten larger and larger to where four or five large companies now buy and own 50 to 70 percent of the total agricultural production of any one given commodity. Whether it be hogs, whether it be cattle, whether it be soybeans, whether it be wheat, whether it be corn, that is moved through the normal market channels. That's the type of strength we're up against, but it's not only in our segment of the economy. Look at how many automobile manufacturers you have now. Look at how many farm implement companies you have. Through the entire economy, we've seen this type of uh, a, a strength in the hands of a very few companies. You can go into the chain stores or retail the food products. It's all a complete change as to what we have known in the past, and it's been coming about step by step. Until now, the farmers are the only segment of the economy that's really unorganized. And it seems so foolish that we should go to the marketplace and say, what will you give me? Come back from delivering hogs or grain or selling milk and then come up the street and anything that we want to buy or any service that we want rendered to us, there's a price tag on it. Whoever's doing it, whoever's selling it, has a price tag that they put on the product. And still we go to the marketplace and say, what will you give me? And still we produce also at the same time the most essential commodities in this country. And we're the ones that are unorganized. And so it isn't by happenstance that the price of oil went up. The happenstance is that several large oil companies that couldn't get together legally here went where the oil was to Saudi Arabia. And there they formed the Arabian American Oil Company. And then they decided to shut off the supply of oil. 
and that would be exported into this country. They changed the routing of ships, tankers. And so today, as a result of that type of economic strength, you're paying more for your fertilizer, you're paying more for your oil, and you know it, and you know how much. That's a type of economic strength that we're up against. And then when we look at what has happened in the way that our products are moved, that you'll find that most of the exports of grain are done largely by four large grain companies in the, in the major commodities. Then you throw in two or three other medium-sized ones, and that's about all of them. Or they are large companies, but not as large compared with the four big major companies. Now, what are we going to do about it? And what structure is there to do anything about it? Well, out of all the efforts that started in this area of Iowa, from a protest meeting, a structure has been put together nationwide that I doubt that any of us realize the impact and the effect of. But I think the real question as we sit here tonight is that with our high fixed cost, we've seen what has happened to the cattlemen. Right now, if the price of grain should drop drastically, I don't think there's any question in anybody's mind what will happen to the cattle price 90 days or 120 days later. We know what will happen with eight, 900 pound grass cattle out on the grass and the range that have backed up and, and the backlog of those. You have the price of grain go down substantially, and you know what's going to happen. There's an awful lot of grain in the country still in the farmer's hands. I tell you what, it's the same people that weren't going to sell their soybeans until they got nine or ten dollars, that then if they could have got seven, they'd have been happy after they'd taken the beating and the drop, then they'd taken six and most of them would be happy or a lot of them at least to get five right now. The same people that were going to get four dollars for the corn still got it. Most areas they'd be happy now a lot of them to get three bucks for it. Uh, wheat that they were going to get six and seven, eight dollars a bushel for. Today they'd be happy, very happy to get four in, in the area. Oh, there's a few of them that still think it may come back and something might happen magically that did. But what we're talking about is stability. I don't see how anybody can live in an agricultural area of economics today without having stability tied at least to a minimum of the cost of production and also plus a reasonable profit. Now, how can we do it as individuals? Well, we can't. There's no way. Because what we're talking about are companies that not only cover this nation, but they also cover the international scene also. And so we either have a choice of continuing to go to the marketplace and saying, what will you give me, without any certainty or any, uh, any way to be able to do anything about our prices, but then going down the street and paying the prices on a price tag. I think we ought to take a moment's time to think about the history of the NFO that you in this area, many of you know so well. That from 1955 to 1958, the NFO was strictly a protest group. In 1958, we started on a collective bargaining program. And from 1958 to 1965, looking back over it without maybe realizing what we were doing, and all we knew that we were doing at the time was that the companies wouldn't accept production from NFO members as a group. So we had a choice. Did we fight? Did we get merged into the old marketing structure as brokers or buyers as a group? Or did we have the holding actions that would show the strength and we did and use hogs as a test commodity? That holding action was no different really and isn't now than the man that sold me this shirt. He had a price tag on it. That was his holding action. So what happened was, from 1958 to 1965, we used holding actions as fast as we could get increased strength together for one purpose. And that one purpose was to get the companies to accept production from the NFO, members as a group. Many of you probably, and I've asked this in this area and many other areas, how many of you sent hogs to Omaha, Nebraska, uh, when we got that acceptance as a group. Hold up your hands. Well, a lot of you did. 
And I never knew for sure, but I'm pretty sure now whether the hogs got butchered to the members, and the members are the ones. What happened was that we had a verbal agreement. We didn't have written contracts. We had no way of supervising, no way to inspect, no way to communicate. And so we ended up going there and them not living up with, to their verbal agreement, which was simply this, that we would get the terminal market price delivered at their plant. Well, you know what this would have meant to us. It would have meant another 30, 40 cents, 100 price advantage, wouldn't it? Well, they didn't live up to it. And it, I, my guess is that history will record that that was a big mistake they made because they could have tied the production into a given plant. Uh, not only Swift, but many of the other companies were involved. And we would have been happy to have taken that type of a price advantage, and I think every one of us would have jumped up and down for joy, wouldn't we? But what happened was they didn't live up to their verbal agreement. So from 65 to 68, it was the beginning of the building of a nationwide collection dispatch and delivery system and the fighting for written contracts. In 1968, we had a meat holding action following the milk holding action in which our goals were many, but the minimum goal that we sought to achieve was written contracts. Those written contracts were won in the 1968 meat holding action, and the holding action was a long action because we hadn't been able up to that point to get assurance that we would get written contracts. We did have the assurance, and therefore the holding action served its purpose. But today, if we were to just have a holding action for the sake of having a holding action, advising our members to hold their commodities, what could we achieve? If it wasn't for a nationwide collection, dispatch, and delivery system, the answer is nothing. All we would do is create confusion and maybe utter chaos in the market because we'd have no way to go ahead and fulfill commitments to companies for our contracts and our prices. So the nationwide collection, dispatch, and delivery system that's been put together is our strength and gives us the ability to be able to tie down contracts for our prices based on the cost of production plus a reasonable profit. Because you have to have a way to deliver that production. You have to have a way to fulfill contracts. And you have to have a way to create your bargaining power and your bargaining strength. And that's through the production of farmers grouping it together. So as we think about this, and as we look at it, we have to decide, is it worth the fight? Probably if we'd have sat down to thought about that a few years ago, we probably, if we'd have known what we had to fight, we'd have probably said no. Because we've had many fights. We've had to fight for our existence. And I think that as we get closer to putting 30% together, I think the fight will be highly intensified. Because I don't think anybody in government, I don't think very few people in the large companies or other walks of life really want farmers to put their production together and be able to price it. I think our friendship really ends, as somebody described it, at the end of our farm gate at the end of our lane in our farms that leads from our farms. But that's really where our friendship ceases. And we have to depend on each other or it's not going to be done. We have put together this nationwide collection, dispatch, and delivery system because of the efforts of many people and because of their hard work and the money they put up to do it. We could have put the organization in the black financially eight, nine, ten years ago. And all that we would have had to have done, all we would have had to have done is to cut back and live off of the fat that had been achieved like other farm leaders and other farm groups have done. And that would have been the easy way. But instead of that, we had meetings with our members from time to time over the country in which we say this is what needs to be done, but our present income isn't enough. 
And if we go ahead and the income doesn't come, we've only got one source of revenue, one source of money, and that's our members. The SEC took most of that away from us when they got involved because of the loans that members had made to their organization for their own welfare and their own, and their own farming operations. But let's look at this nationwide collection, dispatch, and delivery system. The system that I doubt if we recognize the strength of. Those dots represent livestock collection points. They represent dairy reloads. They represent grain accumulation points. All those points that have been put together by members in their areas so that livestock could be brought into a collection point where hogs could be delivered, and if they wanted to, also cattle, where grain can be brought in to be shipped out, and where milk can be brought in to be reloaded onto large tankers and moved out. Now, what is the strength of that? The strength of that is the ability to move several of those out of one area into a new pattern. And what effect does that have? What is the effect? The effect is that those that normally got that production find it leaving the normal pattern. What effect does that have? And the best effect that I know of is if you would put yourself tonight in the position of a hog buyer, in the position of a grain elevator operator, in the position of anybody that buys agricultural production, a broker or anybody else, Right now, with the farmers, we'll use grain as an example, where they're pretty unhappy because they didn't sell their grain when the prices were higher than they are now. They've been pretty grumpy. If you were a grain elevator operator or a hog buyer or anybody else at any time like this, all you have to do is to give the farmers a little coffee. It may make your stomach a little sick as they gripe, but go ahead. You know you're eventually going to get their production. Or oh, you may lose a little of it, and somebody else will get some of it, but you'll get some back. But when the NFO starts putting the production together, what's the first thing you would expect to happen? Somebody tell me. Prices go up, somebody said. What else? What, co what would cause the prices to go up? And how does it? Right? But what would be the what would be your first concern? Your first concern would be that the production is going to move away from you, wouldn't it? Isn't that your first concern? And if that's your concern, what is your next concern? And how would you counteract it? What would you do? Yeah, and who would you usually give it to? I'd go out and give it to whoever I thought was going to put it with the NFO to move it out, wouldn't you? That's who I'd put it with, wouldn't the rest of you? And when that happens, what effect is that going to have? It's going to raise the price in the area, isn't it? And if that's going over all throughout the United States, everywhere, coordinated, moving into new patterns, what effect is that going to have on the general price level? going to have an upward effect, isn't it? Now, I can't stand here tonight and prove to you anything, probably, specifically, that we can say the NFO did this or the NFO did that. All I can do is relate several instances what has happened. Back in the early 60s, the ag economists were saying that in the years of the 60s, they expected hog prices to range 12 to $14 a hundred, and cattle 18 to $20 a hundred. And you know, every time after a holding action, it was a little higher level. Do you remember? Right after the holding action went off, they dropped down until 1968, when we learned how to do it, move it all in one day, with a very, very selective and highly organized information system, that we were able to move a lot of production on a Friday. 
And we were able to do it because of a communication system that we'd used. But then let's look at what happened in 1967, the milk holding action. That was brought because and came about as a result of the price announcements that the milk price was going, what, 40 cents or 100 down? Off of practically nothing then because manufacturing milk prices were down as low as 19, uh, then $2.80 on manufactured. A lot of places, most places, under $3, and the highest anywhere I remember is $3.20. That holding action was called because the dairymen were going out of business such great numbers that there wouldn't have been many dairy farmers left. But what happened? After the holding action, the prices went up. What happened at other times? How many of you remember the sharp drop in cattle and hog prices? How much was it? Remember those two days that we had the holding action? Ten bucks, wasn't it? And I had calls, and this is the one thing that is discouraging. I had calls from my home county of people that I'd known all my life that said, you got to do something. The NFO's got to do something. We had a two-day holding action that was restored, wasn't it? After a six- or seven-day drop. In two days' time, we restored it. Then the hog lifts, the little porkers. And then we come to one that we've recently been involved in that I think we have not done a proper job of stressing. That was as far as the cattle prices are concerned. How many of you remember what the experts were saying six months ago? How long were they saying before cattle prices would come up any? Two years, then they got, as the thing kept going down, they said four, didn't they? What was done? Who did it? Well, the first thing that we did was make an analysis of what the factors that were involved could do to the prices. It was very obvious that the number of cattle in the feedlot was going down very drastically. That meant that the big beef uh, production would have to come from cows. Normally, about 30% of the beef production does come from cows, culling, selling off of the cow herd. We, took, we looked at that, and it was very obvious that what happened in the cow market was going to determine the price for stockers and also fat. And so what we did was call ranchers together, six or eight, five or six, four, whatever it was, over the various states. And what did we do there? We talked to them on this very principle, and we came out with cow control. And what was the prices at the time last fall? The prices varied from 12 to 17 cents. What did we do when we started putting cows together? We didn't start moving them out of the 17 cent areas, did we? Wouldn't have been very smart, would it? The thing was to move them out of the areas where they were bringing 12 cents. Why did we do that? So that we could try to floor them at least 17 cents a pound, $17 a hundred. We were pretty successful in that. And then in the winter, after a trial period, we moved the pure ground beef over 31, 32 states in a period of about six weeks. What effect did it have? I don't know how many of you watched the Omaha paper I watch it particularly. I don't read the Des Moines Racer anymore, and I have to a lot of times. <laughs> but nevertheless, I noticed the ads there. And that's just a little pet gripe of mine, I guess. But anyway, what happened? The average price of hamburger was 89 cents to a dollar and 10 cents a pound before we started moving pure whole ground beef whole carcass beef. How many of you saw the ads in the World Herald, 69 cent specials on hamburger and 59 cents? Do you remember those big 59, 69 cents? In some of the metropolitan areas, it was considerably higher than this, over the dollar 10. But what happened was, as we moved from state to state very rapidly, 
the chain stores began to feature ads, 69 cents, and also in some areas, 59 cents, hamburgers. Now, what did they have in that hamburger they'd been getting 89 cents to a dollar and 10 cents a pound? About 30% filler made mostly of water and additives. What happened when we moved in? Even if they left the same stuff in it, the people would eat a lot more, 59 cents or 69 cents, than they would the 89 to $1.10, wouldn't they? But what happened then? How many of you saw the pure ground beef ads begin to appear? Any of you? Featuring pure ground beef. Then when that, that meant that when they advertised pure ground beef, they had to have at least all beef products within that because then they would have gotten in trouble. That meant no longer the adding of the water and the other additives, non-beef additives. You know, that alone, if we accomplished that, would have been equal to almost all the imported beef brought into this country because most of that is cow beef, hamburger beef. That alone would have been a tremendous effect. Now, I can't prove that this is what raised the price of cattle. I can't prove that tonight. All I can prove is, as I said in the previous meeting, is that the experts were saying nothing had happened in the way of raising the price of cattle in the next two years. Some of them were saying four years. The only point I can prove is the NFO either had an effect or we had an awful lot of dumb experts. It's the only thing I can prove. And so that means the effect of an organized effort, the effect of doing something together, and so the effect of doing something together and the ability to do it together means that that's the function of an organization. So what are we stressing in these meetings? What's the goals of these meetings? The goals is to build the core of people larger and larger and larger, to put together 30% of the nation's production of various commodities, to then have meetings not larger than 10 county areas. And when we have those meetings, there we would vote on our prices based on the cost of production plus a reasonable profit. We'd announce those prices to the world, and if we didn't get them, that would mean an automatic all-out holding action in which we'd advise our members to hold until we got our prices and our contracts. I hope that I can get you to remember one thing, because that one thing to me is the most important thing you could possibly get out of this meeting tonight. And that is vision yourself in a hall many times larger than this, meeting with the fellow members of NFO in southwestern Iowa while your new meetings were going on clear across this nation, across the nation from border to border, in which you'd be raising your hands, voting on your price. Can you think of your hand going up for the first time, voting your prices and on your prices and determining those prices? Can you vision yourself in a hall doing that and being able to announce to the world with a feeling that you had the strength and knowing that you had it to be able to price your products? To be able to pri put a price tag on your products on your terms, the same as everybody sells the products and services to you, instead of going to the marketplace and saying, what will you give me? If that's worth fighting for, if that stability is worth fighting for, then it's worth working for. And if it's not, and if we're not willing to do it, we just as well know it now. We just as well say that it's not worth the effort, that it isn't what we need, and that we want to go it alone. And you know what I think? If the NFO were to announce, or the SEC were to announce, or whoever did it, that the NFO would be closed next Monday, 
I say to you that I believe that in a few weeks there would be panic among the American farmers. Because when there's fear, and I know there's fear right now among farmers, when there's fear, if there's not hope, that means panic. Panic would come about because of the fact that farmers no longer had any hope. Let's not kid ourselves. Probably in this very room, quite a few of you have used the NFO as a crutch. As I say down in Missouri without describing it as a post, a certain kind of a post. And how? I'll tell you what. When your milk test was down, if you were a dairyman, you told the dairy field man, you know, if my test doesn't come up, I'm going to the NFO. And up came the test. A grain elevator that was docking you too much on moisture, you thought. Probably a lot of you said, well, if you don't change that, I'm going to go through the NFO. When a cattle buyer was in your feedlot, and he wanted to take some of those good choice and mark them high good. You told him if they're not all choice, they're gonna, I'm going to go through the NFO. To be honest, that's what's happened. And I think that many of our most bitter enemies that have fought the NFO the hardest have in the back of their minds, because I've had several of them tell me as I talk to them after meetings, They'd say, there's a hard nut. You'll never get him. I go over and talk to him. And I'd end up asking him to join the NFO. And you know what? Invariably, he'll end up and give you the answer for us. Not now, but he said, if things get bad enough, I might. I know right now where the fall has been meeting with seven farmers that are not members. They have about, those seven, about 8,800 acres of row crop. And so he got together with them the other night. He'd had their membership agreement. They have a little local community affair. And these seven couples and this other couple get together. And he's had their membership agreement filled out for a couple years, I think. And he's shown it to them. And so the other night, he put them on the spot. He said, I want to know now that we're going for 30%. Are you going to join? One of them finally answered. He said, well, we've all talked it over. You know that. But he said, not yet. He said, you know, it might be a drought or something might happen and the grain prices go up. But he said, you know, if they go down, we're probably going to join. That is a type of a crutch that I'm talking about. And if that went down, and if that happened and there was no NFO around, there wouldn't be that little ting of hope, would there? They'd all be on their own. All be on their own to be picked to pieces, piece by piece. So there's only one real issue in American agriculture today. That is our price. What are we going to do about it? And are we going to urge that everybody unite their production and be able to price it? There's never been a structure put together like that before. So that as they said today, in Oregon, the call from the man that operates two hog collection points. Oregon doesn't have many hogs. But there in Oregon, those two collection points on hogs are tied together with your hogs here in Iowa. And you know there's some familiar names, packing companies, even out there. We forget that it's the same Cargill in North Carolina as it is in California or in Minnesota or in Iowa. We forget that it's the same armor dotted here and there over the producing area or the same Swift. We forget that. And we think that if we can take our hogs or our cattle over here, that out of that, we have been able to create competition because we beat our neighbor, according. 
I was out in the Malamette Valley area, Oregon, right in here Sunday to a picnic. It's an unusual argument that people in various areas have. In fact, I was surprised that anybody would want to call Corning, Iowa uh, after I was out there Sunday because it had been an area that I really went out there for the purpose to bring it into the organization, really. They've always wanted to operate on their own, in their own way, feeling that they were big enough, and they wanted the NFO as a shield. They had such arguments that we need this account and we need that, and they'd had this argument that the Pacific Northwest is different. And they had the argument that we're the only place where soft white wheat is grown. And so we're the ones that have a special problem. And so I proceeded to try to argue with them on this, step by step, point by point, out on the, the grass in the park at the picnic. And I had made one mistake previously that I wasn't about to make this time. And that was getting off with just a small group. I wanted everybody there so that they could hear the total discussion that I knew was going to come up. So the first thing I said to them, so you think, the, one of them said, we got 50 million bushel of wheat in our area here. I said, so what? It's just a drop in the bucket. Well, they didn't like that particularly at that point, but I got them to thinking. And I said, the next point is, where all do you think wheat's exported in this world, country? Where's the main export? They began to think only Portland is a place you exported wheat from. And I proceeded to tell them that it was the same Cargill, it was the same Continental that exported from California, that exported from the Gulf, exported from the Norfolk, Virginia. And that all they had to do, if they got really united out there, those companies just let, they'd take it out of the other port. And then on the soft white wheat, they said, we're the only place producing it. I said, so what? The only place that produces Durham is in Little Montana and the Dakotas and part of Minnesota. And I said, if the price of Durham gets up there quite a little, what happens? They either substitute for it or they mix what they can. So I said, so what? And by this time, the, the issues were getting pretty hot, you know. And I said, well, the fact is that what happened is that you've got to realize that you're not going to be able to move anything in that Portland market bargaining if you don't have the Montana and the Idaho crops to go with you. Right, friend? The market wouldn't be there. What are you going to do with a valley over there and the Columbia area in Washington if you don't have the big volume of Montana and Idaho to go with you? So we finally got it down. Uh, step by step and point by point till they decided maybe the only thing that they were right on that they have a bargainer in Portland. Well, finally, you don't want to win every point. And I said, it really doesn't make any difference. He can sell it anywhere else as well as he can sell it in Portland with an occasional visit. But if that's what you think ought to happen, well, maybe we can get the man in Great Falls to come out to Portland a couple of days a week. I think it was a good session, more understanding of the total scope of what we're talking about. And that's only the last example that I've had, the only the last illustration that I've been involved in. But if we can just get people to realize than how large the companies are that buy our products and how necessary it is to be organized in the United Nationwide with companies that buy nationwide. And I used another example. They said, well, do you think 30% will do it? I said, no question in my mind. And I used the illustration there that I've used here, and I, I Tell it because it's the best example that I know of that I've had the opportunity to be in conversation with. Because of the fact 
that this top company executive of one of the big grain companies was so explicit and so good in explaining what the NFO was all about. It isn't any different type of discussion than I have had with companies, whether it be Continental, whether it be Borden's, whether it be Swift, whether it be Army, whoever it may be. And I'm careful about mentioning names in the past, but William Wood Prince, in one of the first times that I was able to discuss with a meat packer, as you remember the big fortunes that William Wood Prince had at that time owned Armour, I remember back in the early 60s when we first were able to toss our hat in the door that he said, I don't know whether you're right or not, but he said, I know that my friends in steel and my friends in the industrial companies know what their raw materials are going to cost, how much their production costs are going to be, how much, profit, how much markup they have to get their profit from. I've had big company after big company top executive say to me, we're not so concerned about what the price level is as whether or not our competitors can buy cheaper. This top grain company executive, which I was on the panel in Washington and I told him where I was at to see if some of the people were there, that in Washington State where I was on the panel in which we were speaking before the wheat growers. We, we selected our spot that we would present our ideas and, our, and the discussions on was where we picked numbers. And I happened to pick last that day, fourth spot. Very seldom, I usually went on first everywhere. We usually never had a chance to draw. This time, because he said, I'm going to express the viewpoint of my company, and I'm going to stand for that policy of the company. After we got through, I said, let's go have a cup of coffee. He was very shrewd, he's very intelligent, he presented himself well. He still remains one of the very top executives of one of the four big green companies. What happened then was, he invited us to come to their headquarters. There, myself and two others, met at their headquarters with their international people that were in for a particular meeting when he gave us the invitation. There were about 15 of us. And so riding out from the airport in the big limousine, he looked over to me and he said, Staley, I don't want you to misinterpret this visit. He said, and I almost, I have to catch myself, name the company. He said, you know, we're not about to buy grain off the NFO. But he said, I'll tell you what, one thing, we're in the business to buy grain. If we can't buy it anywhere else, we'll buy it off the NFO. Very simple, very understandable. I didn't meet him again, only an occasional time or two, but not to talk, until I was at the Dr. Borlaug Nobel Prize winning dinner in Minneapolis. And there we met the night before when he was at Dr. Manshow, the common market countries, and I was on the panel the next morning, and he was in the audience. And I hit the grain companies for being against farm programs, trying to buy as cheap as possible worldwide, that they were killing the goose that laid the golden egg. We happened to meet in a place not as wide as this, going from that meeting auditorium into the uh, room where a hundred of us would be for luncheon. And there he I came across, we came across each other there, and he had with him a man, as he introduced himself, or introduced him, as a man that was the agricultural advisor at the State Department, which is a pretty important position, you know. And so what happened was, and we crossed there, he introduced me, the fellow looked at me, and he said, I can't understand you two fellows being friends. Bill was standing here, and his name is Bill, and over right over here was a man from the State Department. And the man from the State Department looked at me and he said, I can't understand you two fellows being friends. And I said, well, I guess that we don't agree on very, very many things, but we do respect each other. And the next question he asked was the $64 question. Explain the NFO to me. And I just happened to remember that out in the Washington State, Pullman, Washington, Washington State University. And I just looked over and kind of glanced at Bill and looked back at the man from the State Department and smiled because I knew I'd probably never see him again. 
And I was wanting to see if Bill would respond, and if so, what? And here's what happened. It worked like I thought it would. As Bill said, well, Staley, uh, this is a man from the big green company, one of the four majors, one of the top executives, and I think will be president. He's very close there now. He said, you know, Staley is president of the NFO, and they're trying to block grain together so we can't buy it anywhere else. He understood, didn't he? But he didn't have to say the second sentence. The second sentence was, you know, they're right. We can outweigh an individual, but we can't outweigh a block. And so there's the story that somebody else says not only that they know what we're trying to do, but at the same time that we can do it. So I used out here in Oregon this story yesterday, Sunday, as I've done it several places, and I, and I repeat it because it's so clear and so you're able to remember when it's just a one-sentence answer, you know. You don't have to, to try to remember a paragraph of answers. So they said, what if we don't get 30% out here? I said, well, you know, you'd have to have some. But I, sup I said, suppose you only get 5% of the production there. But we've got the 30% total nationwide. And we're able to get our contracts based on the cost of production plus a reasonable profit. And so we pick this area here. We take the 5% out under that contract. If the other prices are below that contract price, what are the other buyers going to have to do? They're either going to have to meet it, or at that point, everybody joined the NFO almost, wouldn't they? And that's the reason you have to be nationwide to be able to point in every area. But suppose that you didn't have any NFO there. And there were a few more pockets like that. And they're usually always dominated by one company. And they bought it a lot cheaper. I said, what would happen to the total bargaining effort then? I said, a few pockets like that would destroy the total bargaining effort. And their area, as, they, as we talked, and they knew it. It's an area that's a very productive area. But it's only about a seven-county area in the valley. And they said that our prices used to be much below what their relationship is now with other prices before the NFO was in. Not on the dollar per bushel, but their relations per bushel, per ton, in most cases there, with what they are in other areas close by. Because they didn't have any place to deliver out of that area. And therefore, a few pockets like that would destroy the whole collective bargaining effort. Because it is the same Cargill, the same Continental, the same Bungie, the same Dreyfus. Because as we went back through Portland, I wanted to look at the facilities that exported out of. You know what? Guess what companies they showed us? Cargill, Continental, Bungie, and Dreyfus. You know how many places that you can deliver there by truck? Two. Now, Cargill is usually pretty slow in taking trucks. They said when they want to, they can open it up and unload them fast, but they don't take them very often. There's one other place to unload by truck. You can see what is happening there. They wanted their grain shipped in by rail, basically. This is a type of a system, a type of operation. That goes on everywhere. And this is what well, and why it was necessary to build a nationwide collection, dispatch, and delivery system. And it's why that if we start cutting it back, collective bargaining will soon be destroyed. And by the same token, it's the reason that we had to do everything we could to get over the entire nation. Our collective bargaining would never be a reality or there would never be a chance to achieve it. So we have all this. Are we going to use it? That's the real question. Are we going to work hard enough and put enough effort behind it? As I said, the effort and the challenge is not to cut back, 
the effort and the challenge is to move forward. And as I said 10 years ago, we could have put the organization in the black. No question about it. And I can tell you right now how much you have to cut back so that a few people, or a lot of people, could live off the fat. What does that mean? The income that would come in anyway at a certain level and just cut back below it. That's the easy way to do it. The easy way in leadership is not to come out and fight for 30% to be put together and a holding action which we know is going to be controversial to say the least. A holding action, an all-out holding action. It's much easier for leadership as it has in the past to duck those issues. Because if it was never presented, nobody would ever know, would they? Nobody would ever really know what their goals were. And you'd take the easy route and the easy way out. And that would be the easy way to do it. To rest, take it easy, work when you want to, rather than go from, in my case, as many other cases of many other people, but I came in from the farm on Monday, went home Friday night, went home, came back on Saturday morning for a meeting of the 12 people that were going to conduct the meetings. From there, I went to a Missouri meeting around the Vichy area, Vienna, Missouri. I came back to Kansas City. I got on a plane there at 8 o'clock to go to Portland, Oregon. We drove out to a meeting about 50 miles from Portland. I got back on a plane 10.35, Sunday night and arrived in Omaha at about 5.30 Monday morning. I wouldn't start to do that for myself if it wasn't for a cause, and there's so many other people involved in the local and the district and the county level. And they'll fight as long as the people want to fight, as long as the people support. And that's a determination that we have to make. And last night, to throw in the extra, I was in Cherokee, and here tonight. Sure, I'm tired, but I'm determined, like a lot of other people, that we've gone this far. We have the battle with SEC. They're in our office now, checking the records. It's a battle for life or death, no different than many of the other battles that we have been involved in. And they can wipe us out. Overnight, because if you ever got a receiver that, and they would do it based on what the financial position is, once the receiver walks in that door, they're the boss, not the elected people, board of directors or anybody else. Their basis of them getting in was the dues. We're not coming in sufficient to pay off the loans made by the members to build this system. They're back in because we had them on the ropes last year after the 5.2 million that was raised at Des Moines, and then the few days following from September 16th to October the 10th, our financial position was changed $9.2 million. We promised the people there that if they saved the organization, we'd give them the opportunity to fight. The battle we have now with SEC is not nearly as big. $2,500 a county, we feel will handle them very well, very readily. With that, we have a lot of offensive plans, not in the nature of a bad odor, but in the nature of when we say going on the offense, we'll let the bad odor for them, I guess. But the nature of going on the offense would be in the way of court to roll them back, for uh, establishing once and for all the full uh, completion as far as the Iowa Trust is concerned, which came about from several reasons, but mainly all coming back to one thing, and that was not delivering the grain, and the companies just kept the money. But out of that, or forced it to be kept, but out of that, we're proving that we've got the best pay system in this country. This last week, Coast Pack went broke or closed the doors. We don't know whether they're broke yet or not. 
But the people that had cattle in there are sending their records in. The reserve will pay them for their cattle. Use the insurance from the insurance company and pursue. From there, those, on those documents, the payment from the company. But they'll have their payment in full for the cattle. And those were producers from Idaho, Montana, Washington, uh, even part of California and Oregon. That was the type of a pay system we envisioned with a total system because we never wanted anybody to put production through the NFO that didn't get full pay. Because in the past when farmers had a co-op go broke or an elevator go broke or a buying station go broke or a packer go broke, if they happen to have production in at that time, they maybe went broke. We wanted a small amount to come from every area to build a reserve. And before the SEC hit us, we had lines of credit from some of the major banks in this country that would have made it possible for us to work out of the grain problem over a period of time. But when they hit us, we lost that line of credit. It scared the banks. And so it meant that we had to make the choice of whether to string the payments out, the Iowa Grain Trust, and then just go down and down, and everybody would lose their money, we thought. Or to set up the Minnesota Trust with the improvements that we could make, and to be able then to start from clean and to build it, and to be able then to work out the way that everybody would get full payment. Now the one-third of 1% 1 is in effect. That one-third of 1% 1 will make with the distribution of the cash. And that's the reason or what apparently triggered the SEC coming in was when the trustees of the Iowa Grain Trust went and asked that they would be able to disperse the cash in the Iowa Grain Trust. The people in, in uh, Chicago apparently approved of it. They thought it was a good idea, as reported by the attorneys that met with them. They wanted a letter explaining it. The letter was sent. They went to Washington, and the word came back to hit the NFO. That was, that was the issue that apparently, beyond a doubt, triggered it from all the information we had. So the fights are on many, many fronts. The fights that have to be waged. It won't be easy. It hasn't been. But we must not take the NFO for granted. Because waiting too long is too long forever. It takes a united effort to fight for the very, very lifeblood of rural America. And I am fully confident that we'll be able to do it. But only if the people understand and only if everybody works hard. Now at the last meeting, you didn't do, or many of you, what we asked you to do. Maybe you had problems that are insurmountable. Maybe we asked too much. But we made some progress. But not enough, folks, in this room. Not fast as I want to see it go, at least. And we ask that you bring two couples with you at this meeting. Now, that doesn't seem like too much. But maybe it was. But we're going to ask you to do it again. And I am saying one thing that you don't, a lot of you don't have your wives with you. At least I hope next meeting you can influence your wives to come. And why? Because I'll tell you, as a meeting in Cherokee last night, you know who was taking the notes on what to do? It wasn't the men. The final step, the steps for the next meeting, I'll tell you who was writing them down. It was the ladies. And it's the ladies that are usually the ones that take care of the details, whether it's the books on our farm or whatever it may be. They're the ones that take care of seeing that the details are done. And we have to have an understanding of the ladies and the wives in order for them to understand what this battle is really all about. And I can tell you one other danger that's involved, as far as I'm concerned. And why it can happen so fast in agriculture. I'll tell you when the scales will tip away from the family farms in my mind. 
And that is when the costs get so high and the prices drop suddenly and the farmers can't get financed through the normal credit sources. And here come the companies offering contracts for their production in exchange for financing. They'll come out and they'll offer the financing that you can't get at the local banks or the PCAs or the FHAs. And here they'll come fast. They'll offer contracts, but they'll offer those contracts only based on the fact that they first will furnish you the credits necessary. And you watch farmers jump at it, and when a certain percent of them, and I'll say that when 30% of the farmers' production goes under that type of a contract, because they couldn't get their financial commitments met at the banks or the PCA or the FHAs, I'll tell you, they'll show how you rule and dominate agriculture by 30% of the production. Because they already have that much contracted on their terms at their prices. That's the way it'll be. It won't take it very long to move on through. And that would come very fast. The NFO is the only thing standing in the way, again, of something like that to happen. And I've heard people say, well, you can revive the NFO, you can put it together again, you know. I'll tell you what historians will tell you, that it probably won't be done in this century. Why? Because you look at the movements of people about that long between each movement of people from the history of movements and to their successes or to their failures. So the stakes that we're involved in are very high, but they're the stakes that we can determine. And it comes down to the simple point. Do we understand what this nationwide collection, dispatch, and delivery system really means? Do we understand the impact that a livestock collection point out here is not just a point in that area, but it's part of a total system? And there's one thing that will keep us from achieving collective bargaining. There's one thing that will make it possible for companies to keep farmers divided. It's the one thing that has always made it possible to keep farmers divided. And that is price. Not the price level, but the price competition between farmers. Farmers, ranchers have always competed with each other. I use the example, what would you do if you were a hog buying station operator, elevator man, a dairy plant, the NFO came in and started putting production together, you'd raise the price first to a few, wouldn't you? There's nothing makes a farmer throw out his chest more than to say he beat his neighbor a quarter, you know. Nothing makes the ego any higher usually in the past. And if we get into comparing price, if we get into comparing price, collective bargaining will go down the drain. It'll never be. A few examples. In this area, how many of you are dairymen in this area, in this room? Hold up your hand. Well, I just wonder what happened when we started moving milk out of the area. Did the tests of everybody go up or not? Huh? How much? Am I safe to say two to four points? How many of you agree with me? Hold up your hand. Huh? The rest of you, any more of you that held up your hands? Do you agree with me or not? Check and see if I'm right. Almost happens everywhere. I was down in Missouri the other night, and they got to telling me how that we were 33 cents under the market. That was the price quoted. And you know what? So help me. They got to comparing what had happened to the test on those that got 33 cents more. You know what happened? Their test dropped about four points. One guy really got butchered. His dropped from 3.9 to 3.1. You know what four points on the test is right now? About 32 cents, isn't it? How can you compare price? 
I think one of the examples that I laugh about, and it's not very funny, is that we the one of our accumulation points on grain, wanted as a barge loading point and a rail facility, they wanted a good experienced man to operate. It's a pretty complicated facility. And we lined him up. He went down. The board really thought he was fine. And then when you handle grain, as I understand it, about one half of one percent shrink occurred. And they were bothered about the shrink in their facility. And you know what? They got down, everything was going fine until they asked him about shrink. He said, there won't be any. Well, they want to know how he's going to do it. He said, I'll take care of it on the scale. You know what? They wouldn't touch him with a 10-foot pole. These were NFO members that had learned that you ought to have scales that were honest, but they didn't recognize, and they wouldn't. Everything was fine. They wouldn't have touched him with a 10-foot pole. What they didn't realize was he was telling them exactly how it's taken care of in the trade. He wasn't going to do anything different than what he'd been taught to do. Then we had to follow that I think I told last time on there, the example, and I know there's many cents, that splits and sows, even numbers, weighed them on an independent scale, took some of them to the, half of them to the NFO collection point, and they shrank 13 pounds. He took the other half to a sale barn. They shrank 42 pounds, but they got more per pound, you know. Now, the thousand didn't shrink, the scale shrank. And so if we get to comparing price, we're never going to have collective bargaining. We have to realize that we're going for one thing, holding up our hand, voting on our prices. How many of you would like to hold up your hand, voting on your prices, hold up your hand? How many of you would like to do it? Well, try it again and see how it feels, why don't you? Hold up your hands and leave them there a little bit. Just see how it feels. And say that you were voting on the cost of production. Do you really mean it? Is that worth fighting for? Is that worth a goal that you say you're going to unite your production with the NFO? How many of you really would like to hold up your hands and vote on your prices? Hold them up and think of yourself in a meeting where you were, and keep them up a minute, because you wouldn't vote that fast. And you'd hold your hands a little higher so they'd be counted. Just think, though, how many of you, that for the first time would be farmers, ranchers, deciding their prices, wouldn't it? That's enough to make me want to work. That's enough to make me want to fight, to be able to get in a position to do that, because that's fairness and that's equity and that's justice. And you know, there are many other reasons and I don't want to get into the reasons of revenge. Because if you seek revenge, you better enjoy it while it lasts because it'll only last 30 seconds, probably that enjoyment. I read that once and I believe it and I've lived by it. If you seek revenge, enjoy it while it lasts, it only lasts 30 seconds. But you know, and so I haven't got time for that. I'm not going to be bothered with that kind of stuff. But there's only one big issue in American agriculture today, and that's price. And who's going to determine it? Are we going to the marketplace and say, what will you give me? Or are we going to fight to price our products? That's the real issue. And that's the issue that producers are going to decide. That's the issue that's in your hands to decide. And I suppose that revenge part I talked about, and I don't think my experience has been any greater probably than yours has on this point, but I've had plenty of it on this one point. And that is the people say NFO, and you explain a little to them. And those people outside of agriculture time and again have said, it won't work. Why did they say it? Farmers are too dumb. How many of you have had that said to you? Or that expression? I've had it many times. Farmers are too dumb. I don't believe it. I don't buy it. But we've got to prove it's not true. And the one way we can prove it's not true is that we decide to put enough production together and we price it. A holding action. What's so bad about that? 
Every bit of clothes I got on, everything we bought today on our farm, there was a holding action in effect because there's a price tag or a price we had to pay to get a service performed. That's all we're trying to do. That's what we have to do. You know, we've got the food in our hands in this country. We've got the strength. It should never be abused. But the lack of using that strength is also an abuse of our privilege and our opportunity. Now, we can do nothing about it. Nobody can make you do anything. But it comes down to the issue. Are you or aren't you? And we don't have, we can't be like farmers have normally been. You know, you could sit off here and argue how, how corn ought to be planted or how soybeans ought to be planted or how wheat ought to be drilled or what feed you ought to feed or whatever you want to. And you know, the odd thing about it is it usually all comes out pretty good for everybody. We all do what we want to, when we want to, and how we want to do it. But if you're going to have an organization, the purpose of it is all doing the same thing at the same time. And if we want to change, we change strategy together too, don't we? You can't have everybody going this way, that way, and yonder and ever get anywhere. Whether it's a football team, suppose uh, the guard decided he wanted to call the signal. Huh? Or the end. You know, wouldn't be much of a football team very long, would there? It doesn't make any difference what you're involved in. The only strength is from the fact that you do it together at a time. So what are the two jobs, three jobs? You have the people here. We're going to have that are on the staff, but we're going to have to enlarge that core. There's not enough staff people. There's not enough people in this room for Southwest Iowa. And so we have to enlarge and enlarge and enlarge our core. And we'll only do that if we have in our minds that vision of holding up our hands. The reason I say that, it ought to be something that we could remember every time that we decide not to do that little extra, maybe. Something that we can keep in our mind. So we've got the jobs to do. But first, Lyle, well, I want us to write down 30%, the steps in it, so that we know who will tell me the four steps that I've talked about here tonight. What's the first one? What's the first one? Huh? Put 30% of the production together, right? Group 30% of the production together in various commodities. What's the second one then? That's going through the nationwide collection, dispatch, and delivery system. What's the second one? What's the second one? Right. And what are we going to do there? And then what we're going to do? And what does that mean? Hold until we get our prices and our contracts, right? You know, what would I say if I wanted to talk to a member that is behind on his dues? Or to a prospective member? Or to somebody to put their production through the NFO? What would I say? The NFO is making an all-out effort to put 30% of the production together so we can have meetings, vote on our prices, and if we don't get our prices, it means an all-out holding action. That's all I'd say to him. 
holding until we got our prices and our contracts. We need your help. That's all I'd say. If you can't convince them that that's important enough to do it, those simple statements, those simple points, putting 30% together, and I'm just condensing the steps here. You can go through the steps and be a little more specific, but all I'm doing is condensing. Put 30% of the production together so we can hold meetings and vote on our prices, and if we don't get those prices, We'll hold our products on our farms until we get our prices and our contracts. You know, with a seven-day meat supply ahead at the most four-day fluid milk supply, the ability to store grain, it wouldn't take very long. But the people have to make up their minds to do it. So the three things that we've got to do, one is, We've told you we have to have $2,500 per county immediately. We haven't been getting it fast enough, folks. There's one county in this area since the last meeting has almost made it, and that's Adams County. They were within 50 bucks of it. Some of the other counties that have done pretty fair, the other counties that have done pretty good are the counties Montgomery's made a good stride toward it, some of the other counties that have done pretty good, Fremont County, Montgomery County, Adams County, Taylor County, those are the ones I noticed of over $1,000. I'd hate to miss one. I'll read them off. The Mills had 800, Fremont 1125, Cass County here is 750. Crawford County 825, Adams County 2450, Page County 1405, Taylor County 1275, Audubon County 887, Carroll County 550, Adair County 175, Dallas County 75. I believe it was Taylor County, two, I can't tell whether it's 275 or 1275. 275. There's a mark here. Clark County, 275. Union County, 184.67. Fremont County, 1125. Mills, 800. Montgomery, 1255. Cass, 750. Pottawatomie, 140. That percentage is pretty reflective of what it's been over the whole organization, so you know about how close we are to what we got to have. The SEC knows it tonight, too. They knew it last night. As I told the people that when they come in, they'd want to know our daily balance. So we have to have the work. And I just think this. What a shame it would be and how sad people would be that we've come this far that we didn't go the last mile. That it may be those that say, well, I spent too much money or I've worked too long, I'm not going to do any more. But not to go the last mile after having come this far, to me, would be something that everybody would regret. And you know there's so many things that they can look back and say it ought to have been done this way or it ought to have been done that way. But you know, I can't run very fast, but I can outrun anybody two blocks that looks back all the time. Because if you don't look forward, and I'm not going to try to stand up here only to say that the long, tedious task of getting together a grain accounting system, a system of collection, for our, as far as we're concerned, has been fulfilled. Sure, there may be some mistakes, but it's been a long job that companies told us to take four or five years and we started. The final step in the completion of it and the operation of it is there. And I'm convinced, and I don't know very much about it, that it's right, that we're performing. The other things that we have to do, 
we have to have the $2,500. Those counties, when they reach the $2,500, we're going to ask them to get 15 members, new members, between now and the next meeting, which will be two weeks from now. We're going to come back two weeks. Your job, other jobs are this. Come back and bring two couples with you next time and your wife. Next time. Two weeks from now. Or if there's a bachelor, I guess he just brings the two couples. I see one grinning back here, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> or a girlfriend, I guess, too. Always something to be taken care of. And what's the other thing that we're going to do? What's the other thing? We're going to pinpoint and zero in on commodities. The two commodities that we're going to zero in on in the next two weeks is dairy and grain. You have an opportunity to choose between the two. There may not be any county here, and there may be that wants to concentrate on dairy. In some of the areas, there will be no counties that want to concentrate on grain. And so we're going to give you the opportunity to decide which one you're going to do in your county. Now, how big a job is it that we're going to ask you to do? Well, the job is 10,000 bushel of grain a week, each week, for the next two weeks, a total of 20,000 bushel of grain. 10,000 a week. How many of you are grain producers in here? Hold up your hands. Hold up your hands. All right. How many of you that are grain producers produce 10,000 or more bushel of grain per year? Huh? A lot of you do. I know that. All right, what does that mean? How many bushels were, would a 10,000 bushel of grain from 1,000 counties be in a week? Somebody want to figure it right fast? How much is it? Right, 10 million bushel of grain. That's 10,000 bushel of grain. 10,000 bushel of grain per county a week is 10 million bushel of grain. What effect do you think we'd have on the market with 10 million bushel of grain? Huh? Tell you one, we'd like to have the opportunity to bargain with it for a while. That 10,000 bushel, not more, all kinds of producers produce that a year. I think one of the mistakes that we may be made on price, and I intended to say it, and that is in dairy, when we were looking over what to do in dairy, we found something that was an ideal mechanism that you could use, and that was the Minnesota-Wisconsin series. Why? 48 of the milk marketing orders, the price was directly tied to it, and the other three indirectly. Really directly. Same effect. So we looked at that, and when you find something like that, you want to know how they determine it. We found out the plants reported in from the areas, Minnesota and Wisconsin areas, what they paid for their price, their manufactured price. Simple. What did we do? Put the map back. Guess what? We started moving milk from plant to plant and out of the area. And what happened to the price for 21, 22 months? Was it 22? Months in a row till the co-ops imported the product. <coughs> really what it amounted to. And what happened there? We pulled it out. Ideal mechanism to use. Now, you know, it may not be as good as we want, but you know the effect. And if we'd have got a contract with Swift and Company in 1968, we'd have jumped up and down for joy, wouldn't we? We haven't got a big volume, and it may need improvement, but you know it has the same effect when you tie it to something so much over something. And you saw the price of hogs jump up here right after. And you saw the effect of it. We forget it. Now let me tell you what I think we've made the mistake in the other commodities. You know... The dairy price, the, the price that's paid the producer, 
calculated, and it used to be everybody announced theirs, what, the 15th or 20th, or maybe didn't even announce it, people just got a check in the mail. Guess what we did? You know, we started getting our checks out, or not checks, but the announcement of our price as early as possible. And challenged everybody to beat it. You know Right? That's what we did. I want to ask you a simple question. What's the price of corn around here right now? What? What is it about? Huh? 263. All right, suppose we move some corn out of here at 263. You can do exactly what the dairyman does. You don't have to do like you used to do, sell all your corn at once, you know, one day trying to pick the high market for the year, right? You can put it in different blocks, move part of it. All right, by doing that, what would you rather do? Would you rather that everybody else just paid 263 if we moved it out of 263? Or would you rather they went a nickel higher? What would you rather? I'd rather they went 10 cents higher, wouldn't you? Because I got some more to move right behind it, right? Because what am I trying to do and what am I trying to think about? To get in that meeting where I can raise my hand and vote on the cost of production plus a reasonable profit. That's a challenge we got. That's a type of a challenge. Now, on the 10,000 bushel of grain, if you want to choose dairy, that means that in the next two weeks, that we'll be wanting to, that time your gold will be five new shippers of milk per week. Either 10,000 bushel of grain a week for the next two weeks, or five new shippers of milk. Not both of them, one of them. Everybody zeroes in. Now when you meet here, you have to decide what your goals are going to be in your county, whether it's going to be milk or whether it's going to be grain. And if you decide it's going to be grain, better to get 10 people together, 1,000 bushel apiece, isn't it? Right? On it? Maybe 2,000 apiece, whatever you want to do. Or if one person wants supposed to bring two couples with you and your wife or girlfriend next time, in two weeks, the next thing is you have to decide whether you're going to concentrate on dairy or grain. If it's dairy, it's five new producers participating, two new, five new people participating that are not now participating. It could be either new members that you've got to do it, or it can be older mem or old members or members that uh, haven't been participating. That's five a week for the next, each a week for the next two weeks, or 10,000 bushel of grain from your county for each week for the next two weeks. Now, in order to be able to do this, you have to let your staff man there know what you're going to do. And you have to choose one person that's going to be in charge of either the effort on dairy or the effort on grain. Because if you don't decide one person is going to be in charge, it'll never be done. Somebody's got to say when it's going to be done, ask the people to help do it so it will be done. So those are the decisions you have to make.